Welcome, one and all, to Cinematic Excrement. My quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture wrapped up a few months ago, but the Golden Raspberry Foundation continues to exist despite the rules of logic and good taste, and they recently added yet another winner to that category. It's a slasher flick featuring characters from beloved childhood stories, a concept that at least had the potential to be interesting, were there some actual honest-to-God effort behind the project. But therein lies the problem. Let's get this over with. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. I am not looking forward to this review. Can you tell? I mean, I have seen lazy, cynical cash grabs before. That's the asylum's bread and butter. But I'm pretty sure even they would think Blood and Honey was beneath them. People who make asylum movies are naturally restricted by minimal budgets and, in many cases, competence, but generally, they still try. And they even manage to be entertaining once in a while. I still stand the Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter mockbuster, Abraham Lincoln vs. Zombies, purely for the fact that I get to hear Honest Abe shout as he slashes at the undead abominations before him, Emancipate this. Blood and Honey is not Abraham Lincoln vs. Zombies. Blood and Honey provides neither effort nor entertainment, and I'm not sure it was meant to. If you're wondering how this movie came to be, the copyright for A.A. A. Milne's original Winnie the Pooh book expired in 2022, and it is now in the public domain. And low-budget British filmmaker Reese Frake Waterfield pounced on the opportunity to make a movie about these characters. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with the concept of making movies featuring public domain characters. Disney has been doing that for the better part of a century. But suffice to say, Reese Frake Waterfield is not Walt Disney. Though I imagine he's probably glad he's not Walt Disney, because if he was, he'd be dead. Blood and Honey was filmed in 10 days and cost about $50,000, and I assume the story treatment was written on the back of a cocktail napkin. Thanks to its low budget, it was all but guaranteed to turn a profit, and indeed it made a little over $5 million at the box office. The movie was not highly thought of by critics or the general public. Hell, Frank Waterfield claims the mere announcement of the movie's production resulted in death threats. And I want to make it very clear that I do not condone such things. Say whatever you want about the guy and his shitty movie. I'm about to, but anyone who sends someone death threats purely because they made a bad movie can eat the corns out of my shit. Now that we have that out of the way... In addition to Worst Picture honors, Blood and Honey also won Worst Screenplay, Worst Director, Worst Screen Combo for Pooh and Piglet, and Worst Remake, Ripoff, or Sequel. And in the Worst Picture category, it was up against four sequels. The Exorcist, Believer, Expend Forbles, Make Two, The Trench, and Shazam! Fury of the Gods. This is a bit confusing as the Worst Remake, Ripoff, or Sequel category did not include Shazam or Make Two, but it's not like the Razzies ever made much sense before. Why would they start now? In any case, Blood and Honey was an easy pick for Worst Picture given the competition. Shazam was mediocre, and the rest were just dumb, but not especially terrible. They may make you feel like you've wasted your money. Blood and Honey will make you feel like you've wasted your life. The movie opens with an animated prologue describing how Christopher Robin wandered into the Hundred Acre Wood one day and befriended some strange animals that the movie describes as crossbreeds. For the sake of my sanity, I'm not going to ask too many questions about that. Christopher befriended them and brought them food, but after several years, he grew up and had to leave the woods to go to college and become a doctor. If you're wondering what Chris becoming a doctor has to do with the plot, it doesn't. Incapable of surviving on their own, Pooh, Piglet, Rabbit, and Owl were brought to the brink of starvation and resorted to eating Eeyore to survive. You heard me. They ate Eeyore. This movie wastes no time taking a baseball bat to your childhood. Not gonna lie, a part of me respects the chutzpah. After burying what was left of their dearly digested friend, they made a pact to return to their animalistic roots and never talk again. Because having them not talk was cheaper than hiring people who could do the voices. And I know they were working with a budget that's less than the average annual salary, but having the characters not talk just makes me wonder what could have been. Imagine Winnie the Pooh as a homicidal maniac with that classic Sterling Holloway voice, which I shall now impersonate very poorly. You left us to starve, Christopher Robin, and now we're going to make a meal out of your entrails. <laughs> that would be creepy as hell. And that's the kind of thing this movie should be doing, but it's not. It's not doing much of anything. 
Also, about them returning to their animalistic roots, I'm not sure Frank Waterfield actually knows what that word means, unless you think animalistic involves wearing clothes, using tools and weapons, driving cars, and ritual sacrifice or whatever the hell is going on here. Oh, d -d -d dear we must sacrifice this virgin to the d -d -d devil I promise that will be my last shitty impression of a Winnie the Pooh character. And if you're wondering why I'm not bothering with an impression of Rabbit or Owl, it's because apart from the prologue, they're not in the movie. I'm not kidding. The only two we ever see are Pooh and Piglet. What happened to Rabbit and Owl? Did they piss off and go to their own thing? Were they also cannibalized? Is cannibalized even the right word? I don't know. And the movie's certainly not going to tell you. My guess is they were originally supposed to be in the movie, but Frank Waterfield realized he couldn't afford two more costumes, so we'll just pretend they were never mentioned. We fast forward to a now grown-up Christopher Robin and his fiancée, whose name I can't be bothered to remember because, spoiler alert, she gonna die. He has returned to the Hundred Acre Wood to check up on his childhood friends, and somehow his fiancée agreed to go along with meeting several talking animals. I certainly don't want you to think I'm crazy. I don't think you're crazy, Chris. I just think whatever mushrooms you found while you were wandering around in the woods may have had some unintended side effects. They find where Christopher's childhood friends used to live, but something has changed. Exactly what is not clear, as the movie spends more time telling us something is wrong than showing us. For example... Chris? Is that you? Yes. Why is it like that? Why is what like what? I can't see what the fuck you're looking at! Does Frank Waterfield not understand the concept of framing? Has he never seen... A movie? Reese, the only way the audience can know what's wrong with that photo of Christopher Robin, at least I assume that's what that was supposed to be, is if you show them what's wrong with it! I find it a little disconcerting that I have to spell that out. Deep in the hundred acre wood where Christopher Robin plays, you'll find the abandoned trailer park. Wait, what? Yes, the house at Pooh Corner now features a bunch of trailers. Or, since we're in the UK, caravans. Why? No idea. It's never explained. I mean, the real reason is likely because that's where they could afford to film. Does it make sense? No. But it doesn't matter. Needs must. So day turns to night in the blink of an eye because the director has never heard of transitions and Chris's fiance, along with your childhood, are straight up murdered by Piglet while Chris exclaims, Why are you doing this? And I never would have left, I swear. And why are you doing this? Again. And I never would have left, I swear. Again. This duplicated dialogue is baffling. It's almost like they took two takes of the same scene and put both in the movie. Either that or the actor playing Christopher Robin was improvising his dialogue and ran out of things to say, so he just started repeating himself. Either way, it's so weird. Chris is left alive, but captured by Pooh and Piglet. You can use all the terrible lighting you want, it doesn't hide the fact that those are some spirit Halloween-ass looking costumes. And for the most part, that's it for Chris until the end of the movie. There is a brief scene where Pooh tortures Chris by whipping him with what I assume is supposed to be Eeyore's tail, but really it looks like someone cut off Bianca Belair's braid and dyed it gray. But apart from those few minutes, Christopher Robin is pretty much an afterthought. The premise of the movie is Pooh and Piglet have gone feral because Christopher Robin left them, and then he's barely in the movie at all. What takes up most of the runtime is basically just generic slasher movie number 58,273. The character we actually focus on is a young woman named Maria, played by Maria Taylor. Maria was once stalked by some weirdo, and thankfully the creep ended up in prison. But Maria is still a bit traumatized by the whole thing. Her therapist suggests taking a vacation, so she does exactly that with some of her friends. And this is what leads me to believe the script for this movie originally had nothing at all to do with Winnie the Pooh. The obvious setup here is the creepy stalker breaks out of prison or gets out on a technicality or something, and he tracks down Maria, kills some of her friends, and she and the stalker have one last confrontation before she finishes him off for good. Frank Waterfield made several low-budget horror movies prior to Blood and Honey, and I would not be surprised if this started out as one of his regular cheap-ass films. But he hastily reworked it, turning the stalker into Pooh and Piglet. Of course I cannot prove that's the case, but there is this line. Why would he 
That line only makes sense if she's being attacked by her original human stalker, not an anthropomorphic barren pig that she just met. Anyway, the house they're renting is conveniently right next to the Hundred Acre Wood. And in another sign that this movie was hastily thrown together, there's an 80-yard reference to a sixth girl who was supposed to join them, who we immediately see get attacked and killed by Pooh. This girl is never mentioned again and was clearly not part of the original story. But she did pad out the running time a bit. That was nice of her. Oh, come on. How does he not see her? She's not remotely hidden. Reese. Your lack of understanding of basic shot composition astounds me. Tommy Wiseau is a better director than you. I said what I said. Getting back to our future victims, the first thing the girls do upon arrival is give up their phones as they want to completely unplug and have no distractions. Obviously, this is meant to provide an excuse for the problem that plagues many horror movies nowadays. Why don't they just call for help? The problem is, they just left their phones on a table and can easily grab them whenever they want, as one of the girls does a few hours later. So they tried to give us a reason why they couldn't just call for help, and then immediately abandoned it. What was even the point? The girl who grabbed her phone then demonstrates her stupidity to the audience by taking selfies in the hot tub, one of which accidentally captures the silly old bear. She responds to this by ignoring it and going back to the hot tub, thus allowing Pooh and Piglet to easily kill her. You know, some people just deserve death. The others eventually find what's left of the stupid girl's body, along with the words, get out, scrawled in blood on the window. Which makes no sense. The movie has made it quite clear that Pooh and Piglet are homicidal maniacs. They don't want the girls to leave, they want them to die. I don't know if this is just terrible storytelling or a half-assed reference to a much better movie, but I'm not happy about it either way. At this time, Maria reveals she has a gun. Wait, what? Somehow, a British Gen Z woman has a gun, but does not have a phone. And like that, you've lost me. Fleeing the house, the girls find and free Christopher Robin. He directs them to another woman who appears to have been tied up for the previously mentioned ritual sacrifice, and she reveals some very interesting things. And by interesting, I mean stupid. Remember how Pooh and Piglet vowed never to talk again? Apparently this vow was more of a polite suggestion. Pooh Piglet. That's what they call themselves. They talk. It's broken. This movie's runtime is less than 90 minutes, and it couldn't even keep its premise straight for that long. They free the woman who takes the gun and decides to go piglet hunting. It doesn't go well because Maria's dumbass forgot to load the gun. She dies, piglet dies, most of the girls die, these random passersby try beating the shit out of Pooh in a scene that reminds me entirely too much of Shaun of the Dead, making it far too silly to be scary. Unfortunately for them, Pooh is apparently invincible, and they die. Pooh gets sandwiched between two cars, but shrugs that off too. Come on, even Michael Myers would be dead by now. And after Chris tries one last time to reconcile with his old friend, Pooh utters the only two words we hear him say in the entire movie. He then repeatedly stabs Maria in the head while Christopher Robin runs for his life. And... that's it. The movie doesn't really end, it just sort of stops and a message after the credits promises us Winnie the Pooh will return. That sounds like a threat. Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey is a colossal waste of time, which is remarkable considering how little time it takes to watch and how little time they spent filming it. Calling it half-assed would be generous. Calling it a movie would be generous. It feels more like a collection of ideas for different movies that were haphazardly thrown together in the name of a cynical cash grab. And even putting aside the budgetary limitations, it's just poorly made. Frank Waterfield has no idea how to tell a coherent story, nor any understanding of even rudimentary filmmaking techniques. He sucks, and his movie sucks. And yet, his promise at the end of the movie has been fulfilled as he has embarked on creating a new cinematic universe with a sequel to Blood and Honey coming out earlier this year. And I've heard it's actually an improvement. I suppose that shouldn't surprise me too much. When you hit rock bottom, there's nowhere to go but up. But still, I am genuinely curious. When I finally get a chance to see it, I'll let you know how it goes. In any case, if you're dying to see a movie about a grown-up Christopher Robin returning to the Hundred Acre Wood, they already made that movie six years ago. And sure, it's not perfect. The plot deals with a grown-up Christopher Robin who spends far too much time with work, neglecting his family as a result. And by the end of the story, he remembers how much he loves his family and learns the importance of having a good work-life balance. 
Gee, never heard that one before. But it's very sweet and actually has decent voice actors, including Jim Cummings as Pooh and Tigger. If you have Disney+, Plus, give it a watch. As for Blood and Honey, if you have Peacock, well, unless you're a wrestling fan, I don't know what makes Peacock worth a subscription nowadays, but this ain't it. Blood and Honey isn't even worth a free trial. It's not entertaining, it's not scary, it doesn't get anywhere near so bad it's good territory, it's a waste of beloved characters, and in the end, it'll leave you feeling more miserable than Eeyore. Well, thank God that's over and I don't have to deal with the Razzies for another year. So in lieu of worst picture winners, let's take a look at a terrible comic book movie. Next time, it's Morbin time. Oh my god, Bear is driving! How can that be?